And here we are back at our newest, latest edition of Bored to Death 2.0. Trauma is our middle name live edition. Uh, once again, we, we're trying to record this so we can actually have an, an episode that ends up on our YouTube channel. Um, if, if you're at home and you could knock on wood for us, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. I don't know if this is real wood, but... Close enough. It looks like it. Exactly. Guys, before... Before I get into anything we're talking about, which is... Today is generational trauma. I... Have a need to talk about something. And for several... Several reasons. Excuse me. Uh... First and foremost is what I'm going to start out with is very relevant to trauma in and of itself, which is obviously the overall topic of Bored to Death 2.0. Trauma is our middle name. But also the, the number of people that are very near and dear to me in the country of Australia. A few days ago, there was a horrific event at a, uh, sorry, I've, I've got to reference my notes, at a, uh, a Westfield shopping center. And, and please, I apologize if I'm uh, pronouncing this, uh, this area wrong or anything like that, uh, Bondi or Bondi, where several stabbings happened. Um, six dead and this is relevant because this is the type of thing that happens with unresolved trauma people act out when they don't deal with with the stuff that's going on inside their heads, inside their bodies. There's a, a quote from uh, a book that had a very big impact on me, a uh, very big impact on Chris. And, and I don't want to go without mentioning that, that Chris, Dr. King is with me here today. <laughs> And that quote is, hurt women hurt themselves. Hurt men hurt others. The assailant was a man. All of his victims that I've looked up are women. Those women are, their names are important. Ashley Good, age 38. Ashley just became a mother. Don Singleton, age 25. Jade Young, age 47. Parika Darshia, yeah, Parika's family. I apologize if I'm butchering your daughter's name. I don't mean to. Age 55. And Don Singleton. Age 25. There's a sixth victim that has gone unconfirmed. Some things that I've read that that um, that sixth victim could be a male. These are daughters, mothers, cousins, friends, mothers. And not to leave if, if that is if that is a man, someone's son. 
possibly someone's father. I don't know much, many details about the sixth victim. This is, the, this is why dealing with our trauma is so massively important. Because let's face it, guys. And when I say guys, I, I am mostly talking to men. More times than not, when men bury their trauma, they hurt other people. And we've seen that over and over again, especially in this country. I know the United States is not unique to this. That phenomenon manifests itself all around the world. And that just reinforces how just how important this mission is that we have a board to death 2.0 trauma is our middle name so think about ashley think about dawn think about jade think about perika and think about this never happening again it 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 may very well be a pipe dream but i'll tell you what I'm not going to think about and I tell you whose name I'm never going to mention the assailant he doesn't deserve to be mentioned in the same sentence paragraph whatever monologue of any of these people and on this show, he never will. That's just how I wanted to start out this episode. Guys, we are gonna <laughs> we are gonna have some fun today because generational trauma is the topic of today's episode. Chris can get kind of funny. <laughs> right? Like I I I know it can for me. I was Well you can laugh about it now. That's true. Now, now some of the stuff that, yeah, now I can laugh about it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a good point. And in hindsight, we can laugh about a lot of stuff that we couldn't, that we couldn't otherwise. Like I tell you some stories and I'll chuckle and most people would be like, oh my God, really? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that happened to you? Like, and they look at you like, you morbid yeah, son of a like, bitch. Like I'm the crazy uh, one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So. Guys, like I said, I just want to start out um, doing that. Like I said, for one, because it's very important to so many people I, uh, I care about deeply and cherish live over in Australia. And I kind of, because of that, I sort of feel like it's my second home. So we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back here and talk about generational trauma. It's going <laughs> to... It's going to be a fun, informative, you know, sometimes. It, and who, whoever knows like, wow. the twists <laughs> and turns that, oh, whoops, that, want, that our brains will take here on it, Board to Death. It makes you want to say it's, it's going to be light. No, it's not. But yeah, it'll, <laughs> it'll get heavy. I mean, I was saying like, it's going to be a fun episode. And 15 minutes later, I'm like, Whoa! just <laughs> bawling like an idiot. It's okay. But I'm an emotional man. I make no apologies. <laughs> but uh, anyways, guys, we'll see you back here in just a couple minutes. And here we are back at our newest, latest edition of Bored to Death 2.0. Trauma is our middle name. Live edition. Uh, once again, we, we're trying to record this so we can actually have an, an episode that ends up on our YouTube channel. Um, if, if you're at home and you could... Knock on wood for us. I would appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. I don't know if this is real wood, but... Close enough. It looks enough. like it. Exactly. Guys, before... Before I get into anything we're talking about, which is... Today is generational trauma. I... Have a need to talk about something. And for several reasons several reasons excuse me uh 
first and foremost is what I'm going to start out with is very relevant to trauma in and of itself, which is obviously the overall topic of Bored to Death 2.0. Trauma is our middle name. But also the, the number of people that are very near and dear to me in the country of Australia. A few days ago, there was a horrific event at a, uh, sorry, I've, I've got to reference my notes, at a, uh, a Westfield shopping center. And, and please, I apologize if I'm uh, pronouncing this, uh, this area wrong or anything like that, uh, Bondi or Bondi, where several stabbings happened, um, six dead. And this is relevant because this is the type of thing that happens with unresolved trauma. People act out when they don't deal with the stuff that's going on inside their heads, inside their bodies. There's a, a quote from uh, a book that had a very big impact on me, a uh, very big impact on Chris. And, and I don't want to go without mentioning that, that Chris, Dr. King is with me here today. And that quote is hurt women hurt themselves. Hurt men hurt others. The assailant was a man. All of his victims that I've looked up are women. Those women are, their names are important. Ashley Good, age 38. Ashley just became a mother. Don Singleton, age 25. Jade Young, age 47. Parika Darshia, Parika's family, I apologize if I'm butchering your daughter's name. I don't mean to. Age 55. And Don Singleton, age 25. There's a sixth victim that has gone unconfirmed. Some things that I've read that that uh, that sixth victim could be a male. These are daughters, mothers, cousins, friends, mothers. And not to leave if, if that is if that is a man, someone's son, possibly someone's father. I don't know much many details about the sixth victim. This is the this is why dealing with our trauma is so massively important. Because let's face it, guys. And when I say guys, I, I am Mostly talking to men. More times than not, when men bury their trauma, they hurt other people. And we've seen that over and over again, especially in this country. I know the United States is not unique to this. That phenomenon manifests itself all around the world. And that just reinforces how, just how important this mission is. 
that we have a board to death 2.0 trauma is our middle name so think about ashley think about dawn think about jade think about perico and think about this never happening again it 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 may very well be a pipe dream but i'll tell you what i'm not gonna think about and i tell you whose name i'm never going to mention the assailant He doesn't deserve to be mentioned in the same sentence, paragraph, whatever, monologue of any of these people. And on this show, he never will. That's just how I wanted to start out this episode. Guys, we are gonna, <laughs> we are gonna have some fun today because generational trauma <laughs> is the topic of today's episode, Chris can get kind of funny, <laughs> right? Like I, I, I know it can for me. I was, well, you can laugh about it now. That's true. Now, now some of the stuff that, yeah, now I can laugh about it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a good point. And in hindsight, we can laugh about a lot of stuff that we couldn't, that we couldn't otherwise. Like I, Tell you some stories and I'll chuckle. And most people would be like, oh my God. Really? <laughs> That's that that happened to you? Like, and they look at you like, you morbid yeah, son of a bitch. Like, I'm the crazy uh, one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, guys, like I said, I just want to start out um, doing that. Like I said, for one, because it's very important to so many people I, uh, I care about deeply and cherish live over in Australia and. I kind of, because of that, I sort of feel like it's my second home. So we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back here and talk about generational trauma. It's going to, it's going to be a fun, informative, you know, sometimes it, and who, whoever knows like, oh. the twists <laughs> and turns that, oh, whoops, that, <laughs> that our brains will take here on it, board to death. It makes you want to say it's, it's going to be light. No, it's not, but yeah, it'll, it's, It'll get heavy. I mean, I'll say like, it's going to be a fun episode. And 15 minutes later, I'm like, just bawling like an idiot. It's okay. But I'm an emotional man. I make no apologies. <laughs> but uh, anyways, guys, we'll see you back here in just a couple minutes. Okay, we're back. Okay. Um, I don't think it's so much. Um, it's supposed to be a dig at you. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's more. <sighs> And, and there, I didn't, I don't know. You it don't, was you either. don't, yeah. Like you may not have taken it or you may have taken it as that, but I think that was the way that like, again, we're talking about generational trauma, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was the way that their parents spoke to them to get them in gear. I took it as a, a subtle slash not so subtle challenge yeah. to up my game okay when that makes and that makes sense like like when i was talking about which this, is good no it which, is. which is healthy yeah and um and sorry i don't mean to cut you off i i meant to do this before and I'm, chris i'm sure you probably want to do the same thing um and it's i think it's important that we take the time to do this With generational trauma and with the experience that Chris and I have, the similar experiences growing up that Chris and I have both had with uh, being raised by all accounts, some very kick-ass single moms. Most definitely. And there's no instruction manual that comes with being a mother ever. No, no matter no matter how much support they have, they are both of our mothers did the absolute best with what they could and the best that they knew how. 
my mother, I will, and, and Chris knows this, I will brag about her forever and ever and ever. I would talk about her accomplishments over my own any day. And I do because she is incredible. And any success that I have had in this life is because she raised the bar to the extent that she did. She was an amazing mother. Because of having to raise multiple boys on her own, work full time, go to school, accomplish some of her own dreams, which she has done, and, it, and it's incredible to see how those have manifested and, and where those are now. A byproduct of that, as her son, made some things difficult. Her being a single mother and the experience she had with my father, which was a negative one, manifested itself on my own self-image as a man a lot. And that, and because of that, I fall into those traps as not just being a people pleaser with women, but finding myself and always wanting to be a hero for them. <laughs> and because of that not so positive experience with my father, the view of men that myself and I don't want to speak for my brothers, but I, I think I'm at least close on this. We sort of absorbed that as kind of being bad for the sheer aspect that we were born as men. Did you have any of that? No. Okay. I didn't. Um, Again, my mom, kick ass, you know, love her to death. Mm -hmm. Just uh, try to get a little closer. Uh, love her to death. Uh -huh. And um, so I have, I have to ask, um, did your mother, like, ever seek another relationship? Yeah, she had, um, and that's a great question. I know this is something we've talked about off camera uh, a bunch. Uh, yeah, she had some, and I think I know where you're going with this, just... I'm so glad you're here. You can kind of, <laughs> like it's um, it's really really cool. And if you guys don't know, like Chris and I have some a lot of parallels in our own lives. So it's uh, it's kind of a it, it's a joy and really cool that he's here to, you know, play pitch and catch with a lot of this stuff. But um, to answer your question, yeah, there were some amazing boyfriends. Um, and outside of them some amazing influence male influence that uh my uncles her sisters husbands mm -hmm. you know brought in stuff like that but one thing i was always incredibly incredibly lucky with and my brothers were too is every boyfriend my mom had had an interest in us as well so that's so in some aspects i feel like i I might have gotten like a better experience than some people that actually have fathers is yes. because there's a lot of people I've met that have like shit dads. Right. And there's, and I know I'm not trying to like stigmatize anything like that. It, I think it's, it's probably just the people I've met. I've, I've met a lot of women with some dads and I don't want to, add to any stereotypes about like daddy issues or anything like that. I'm not trying to do that at all. I can, like I said, and, and I'll, I always state this, I can only speak from personal experience. Exactly. And I know there's a lot of men that have had that same experience as well, but that's just, you know, from my own, but, but yeah, those boyfriends were always really involved. Okay. And, but so with her experiences with your father kind of mm -hmm. led her to, seek 
companionship that wouldn't put her in that position anymore, right? Seemingly so, I would, okay. I would guess. Yeah. Well, uh, so that, you know, like we say, we have a lot of parallels. This is, this is where we veer off, of course. Okay. You know, because my mother, love her to death, mm-hmm. but my mother was a hopeless romantic. Like, she just wanted to give love and wanted to be loved. Mm-hmm. And in doing that, she picked some shit. Yeah. Like, talk about toads. No, like. Well, do tell. Oh, yeah, I will. Let's get let's Whereas, get juicy here. So, like, you, you speak of, you know, uh, the positive influences. Mm-hmm. I didn't have that. Like, my stepfather, the last person that my mom dated. So, she, did your mom ever remarry? Yeah. Just okay. one guy. Okay. And um, that guy was. An ass, mm-hmm. just complete other app. Like if I ever saw that man again, we were fighting. <laughs> there's no questions about it. There's there's no um, no nothing else other than we're some. Oh. Fr- Let's uh, take a quick break. Cover that, guys. If you don't mind, on the if you're watching on the live, we're just gonna take another quick break here. Okay. And one. So, guys, uh, we're back. Thank you again if you're joining us on the uh, live broadcast of this. There, um, can you kind of bring everybody up to speed of what we're okay. talking about? So, like I was talking uh, about earlier, where I was asking you about, you know, your mother and her um, meeting someone else, you know, the after your father, and yeah, stuff, yeah, and the fact that again, my mother. You know, she was this hopeless romantic, mm-hmm. and she would meet um, men, and just because she was so hopeful mm-hmm. to be in this relationship, she was so hopeful for whatever good could come out of this, she let a lot of things fly. Mm-hmm. You know, she let a lot of things go, just thinking that, you know, he, he'll he change mentality, right? Like some, she'd let some bullshit slide that... Otherwise, like the woman, the woman you knew her as wouldn't, would never put up. No. And it's because, you know, she was so wanting of love Mm -hmm. and I don't want, I don't want to make it sound like I'm knocking my mom. I understand this because, you know, I got it from her. Like I was, Mm -hmm. I dealt with a lot of stuff in relationships in the past and, and I think even like way back when we had this conversation where mm-hmm. we were talking about something you was dealing with mm-hmm. and I was quick to get on and go, no, you need to get out of that. You need yeah. to walk away. You need to not, you know. But at the same time, we both know that because, <laughs> because of some of that stuff, we, whether it's earned or not, I want to, this is. This is something that I think it's important to choose the words correctly um, because there are there are a lot of men that are pieces of shit to women and having experienced that firsthand sometimes with growing up both of us right you know seeing that to the person that in a lot of aspects we care about the most and look to the most, whether we, whether we should or not all the time, it's, that's the, we put our mothers on, on a pedestal. Well, yeah. And so I know you and I have both found ourselves. We get into, if we are in a bad relationship, We don't, we won't quit no. because we, we don't want to be that asshole piece of shit that walks away. we had to experience yeah. that walks in and out of your life. Exactly. And, um, and, and doesn't stick around for like the tough stuff, whether it's, um, whether it's earned or not and try to 
and I'm just speaking for myself here and, and maybe you've had that experience too, but trying to save a woman from herself. Sometimes I know I found, I find myself in that sometimes. Yeah. And, and I kind of search my mind for the best choice of words, but sometimes that is a situation I find myself in. It's fixing the situation. Like more so. Yeah. The, yeah. And like fixing if, it, but also like seeing, okay, like your actions are, okay. They're not just affecting your life. Like having been in some relationships with some, some other single mothers. Right. Like realizing, and I don't mean to come off any harsher than I, I don't mean to come off incredibly harsh, but there's some that's like, okay, your actions are not just affecting you. They're affecting your child. They're affecting your family. They're affecting us. Yeah. And, but still <laughs> going through it with them because yeah. you don't want to be the quitter you but know? and constantly in your mind you think you, of yourself as that piece of shit guy that and that's the thing mom. you do that and you don't realize you're doing that to your detriment mm -hmm. you know you're you want to be the bigger person you want to be the savior maybe whatever it is like you say you don't want to quit mm -hmm. you want to show that you are in this you care uh -huh. you know but that I'm not like other guys. Yeah, but then you have that friend again on the outside looking in, mm -hmm. and they can see what's going on. Oh, where your friends are, they've got twenty twenty vision. Oh yeah, and that's and that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like my mom, the last time I remember again, it was my stepfather, and she she overlooked so many things, mm -hmm. and it didn't resonate with her until it started getting physical oh and it started with her and then it came to me mm -hmm. and that's when you know she decided okay this is a bad situation mm -hmm. you know and again it's just that was one of those things like even like to this day you know like i said my mom she just wants to be loved mm -hmm. you know she she has love to give. She wants to give love mm -hmm. and she wants to be loved. And, you know, that's her thing. And I used to be like that for so long. And I put myself in situations like that as well. But then can you give, uh, I don't would wanna... you mind sharing an, an example? <laughs> well, so yeah. obviously like don't mean, you know, we don't well, we'll mention any names oh, yeah, I won't mention like that. Like, okay. It's, uh, I was with someone for everyone deserves that. I was, anonymity. I yeah. was with someone for a while and, mm -hmm. um, they started becoming a little manipulative. Mm -hmm. They started, uh, separating me and my friends mm -hmm. and they were pushing marriage. Like when you say separating, like trying like, to divide. Yeah. Between. Like, yeah. Like not wanting to spend, not wanting me to see my friends, mm -hmm. but you know, we were always doing something with their friend group. Did she sort of try to make your friends out to be a, like a bad example on you? No, it was something? just more. No, it wasn't more. It was just more so not wanting me to go do something with my friends by myself. Okay. okay. Or if, you know, it was a group thing and mm -hmm. she was invited not being available at that time. Oh. So it was never negative. Like, mm -hmm. she never said anything negative about my friend group. But it was very subtle. Yeah. It was okay. just, we didn't have the time. But then all of a sudden, when her friend group, we had the time to go do this mm -hmm. thing, right? And you know, with our schedule, it's stupid. So, oh, yeah. You've got to, you've got to really pick and choose how you spend that time well because it doesn't exist. Right. A lot of it. And um, so. You know, you go through that, and then it was, well, she wanted to get married. And so first it was the promise ring. You know, I had to get a promise ring to show that I was in this for the long haul. You're committed. Yes. Uh -huh. And then I got the ultimatum. I want to be engaged by this date. By this month, I want to be engaged. And if I'm not, we have an issue. So right? how did that, how did that make you 
feel because I'm sure whatever your thought process was came a lot from my thought process at the time. I felt guilty Mm -hmm. because I wanted to make her happy. But at the same time, I wasn't ready for that step. And I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Why wasn't I ready for that step? Mm -hmm. And, you know, generational trauma is like, am I seeing the things that happen with my mom? Do I think it's going to happen with me? Mm -hmm. Like, what is going on? So I'm not seeing it from the lens that this isn't good for me. I'm seeing it from the lens of, we'll take that break and... Yeah, I got to just uh, hold on one second. And one. So right. again, it probably wasn't through that lens of, you know, I'm realizing that this situation isn't good for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more, I'm worried that this may end up like it did with my mom because mm-hmm. at the time was I happy? No, but I was content. You know, I was living, I was going through life. Things were being taken care of mm-hmm. and it, it was never, it was never just blatantly. I'm not doing right. You know, if that makes sense, it was it, very subtle things that was happening. When I look back now, I was like, I'm like, Oh <laughs> yeah. Never again type situation. Yeah. And it's in, can I ask you a couple questions? Yeah, go ahead. So when this was going on, when when that ultimatum was put to you, how much of your past and you, you kind of you kind of answered this to an extent, but on a certain level, like how much were you questioning yourself that? By God, I'm really having a tough time wording this. How much pressure did you feel to just go along with what she was saying based on the fact that you felt guilty just for being who you are? So much. Like, all that pressure in the beginning when I got the ultimatum Mm -hmm. and... My mindset was, how do I put this? My mindset was, there's nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, we're good. Mm-hmm. Why can't I just do this? What is wrong with me? Why can't I just go along with this? Did you ever, uh, was, there, was there ever a time you talked And I guess have that conversation of why is this, why is this date so important to you? No, that was no, actually. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. thinking about it now, it was because and and I've done, I asked that question because I've done that too. And I realized it could be, even though this seemed like I was in a situation with like a pushy woman with extremely high expectations. Mm hmm that I was also in a lot of those times too chicken shit to ask the right questions. Yes. And, and, and exactly what it was. I was, I was afraid. Mm -hmm. I was afraid to ask that question because again, I'm thinking somehow this is my fault. Why am I not ready for this? What is, what is going on with me that I am not ready to take this step? Mm -hmm. I say, I care about her. I say, I love her. Mm -hmm. You know, we're living together. Yeah. It was like, we, for all intents and purposes at this point, I should be ready to start, mm-hmm. you know, to take that next step, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, it, and then I have a talk with a friend and I, I tell them what's going on, what the situation is. And um, he just pretty much right out told me, he's like, run, man, just run. And I'm like, what? He's like, no, seriously, run. This mm-hmm. is, this is not for you. Just run. And then, I didn't argue with him. I didn't think about it. Or it's just, mm-hmm. I just went back to the fact that there was an ultimatum placed on it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you care about somebody, like, I understand this is something you want, right? Mm-hmm. I get that. But if you care about somebody, do you really put something like that on them? The, the answer is no. The, I would say, and obviously I'm on the outside looking in and hindsight is 2020. Right. And I'll, 
you know, I've had, God knows I've had my fair share of, you know, monumental screw ups, you know, the, um, I would say she was wrong to do that. Your friend also didn't give you, wasn't giving you the best advice. Probably not, but at the same time, uh, you know, he was wor- he was more worried about me mm-hmm. than he was about her. Right. He he cared a lot of he cared a lot about you, and I, right. I think that's obvious. The, but that's kind of in a nutshell some of the stuff when we're talking about generational traumas, the stuff that we witnessed growing up. Like those, whether or not, like, if you asked, asked those important questions, if you, if the answers were palatable or not, is that in a lot of times in the past, you and I haven't even, haven't even taken that step. Hmm. And because of a lot of the stuff that, that yeah. we grew up with. Being afraid we, to ask those questions. Yeah, being afraid to ask those questions. Being and, afraid to have that talk. Yeah, because, and that's something... But when you feel like you're in the wrong, mm-hmm. it's hard to... Right, you know... Right. When you feel like a bad guy yeah. just by existing, yeah. sort of. Yeah. And it's like, so... Even like if I have this talk, I'm gonna make it worse mm-hmm. because I'm already in the wrong. Right. So I can't make it better... If I have this talk, mm-hmm. you know, so you just swallow it, eat it. And it's like, if it, I honestly, if it wasn't for that friend, mm-hmm. give me that advice and me mulling it over, I would already be divorced, <laughs> you know? And I only say that. <laughs> I and, don't mean to laugh. I don't, I don't No. And I only say laugh. that because like after, you know, I had this conversation with her and it's like, I didn't like the ultimatum and she just basically said, well, then we're done. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, well, we're done. And then I moved out, got my own place within a year. And that's so weird in and of itself. Like, and like the, the lack of flexibility there. And, and granted, like, again, hindsight being 2020. You obviously made the right decision. Right. Because if she had zero flexibility to incorporate your feelings and why you felt some way and plugging those into like her plan and being like, okay, I can adjust this at least a little bit to right. accommodate to the well, person that I'm supposedly I'm in love with enough to. And that's my thing is like the rest of my life with them. And know? that's my thing is like, I got the ring. This is, this ring signifies that I want to be with you. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you to marry me someday. I'm just not ready at the moment. Mm-hmm. And it's like, why rush? Like why push that? What is so important about this being engaged and being married and whatnot? And again, that first ring, the prom- promise promise ring. ring yeah. Was, by her request. Correct. Yeah. To me to so prove. She, so she had already asked, like, okay, if you do this for me, that shows me that you're correct, committed and into it. Exactly. But if you don't commit to this exact date, then you're, you're not into it. Exactly. And, like, I, so within a year of me moving out, mm-hmm. us breaking up, within a year, she was married. And that's heartbreaking because of the time, for a couple reasons. One... Because it brings into doubt whether she even felt yeah. anything about you. Like, and no, I, it I'm does. Sorry, and I don't mean to like. No, no. That in, but that, but then, that that would do that to me. And no, that's exactly what it was. I realized it wasn't that she wanted to marry me. Yeah, she just wanted to be married. Like she wanted that status of being married. And, and in her defense, and in her. Defense, and I'm I, and I don't no, s- I don't say this as being like any less of a friend know, to you. You know I love Devil's Advocate. Yeah, I'm just that had to be some 
of her generational trauma. And and it right? may as well. Like I, it's possibly. because I think, I, Yeah, I don't want to like come to any conclusions. No, but, but in the realm of possibility, I, I think it's... It's, um, it's possibly. Okay, uh, quick break. One more time. This is... Okay, cross your fingers, Chris. Okay, we're back on. But, and like you were saying, that may be a part of her. Because, I mean, and this is the thing, too. Came from a loving family. Mm-hmm. You know, father, mother, together forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, siblings. They were all married. So, I don't know if that was, mm-hmm. the you know, where she felt like she needed to be married to be whole. Which, you know. Or to feel like. One of the guys for like I, in, in her family, yeah, like, and that's to, and that's the thing, and that you know I never felt any pressure from mm-hmm. her family. Like her family loved me, I mm-hmm. loved them. I even you know see them from time to time. We speak, and um, so yeah, and it was just and to me the thing was it didn't it wasn't to me that she didn't care. Mm-hmm. That wasn't my mindset when I found out she got married. Mm-hmm. It was just. I was a puzzle piece. It's like she had this puzzle mm-hmm. and one of the pieces of this puzzle was marriage. And I was just a piece that fit in that, you know, I was a puzzle piece that would fit there. Can I ask some follow up questions? Go ahead. So coming, coming to that conclusion that you did, I, I know if that was me personally, that would bring even more doubt into my heart and mind whether I was a worthy man. Yeah, no. I, did you, so did you, was that going on too? No, yeah. Yeah, when, when you realize that they weren't in love with you. Mm-hmm. They were in love with the idea of you. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't you as a person. It was mm-hmm. just the fact that you were a man that fit this role of being a man in their life. Which is really fucking tough because it's like, as you stated, it's not you. And it's not necessarily the man you could be. It's the man they were want you to turn into yeah and that and that man maybe and and this isn't a you know a shitting on like girls segment or anything like that i I don't want it to come off like that because because men do this men do this with women as well it's it's not talked about as often well no it, it does happen and that's the thing it's like my generational trauma, watching my mom go through shit, mm-hmm. you know, it made a play in my decisions on whether or not I was ready for marriage or mm-hmm. I wanted to be married. Well, you know, and that was the thing. Like you say, were you worthy enough? That mindset mm-hmm. and it was like, I, I didn't feel worthy enough mm-hmm. at the time. And then at the afterwards, it was like, okay, well, is there something broken in me? that I feel that I feel this way. It's mm-hmm. like why am I not ready? I I know for a fact watching what was happening with my mom that I would never be like one of those men. Mm-hmm. You know, all all the shit she got put through, Tim all of that, oh, I almost said her name. <laughs> <laughs> all of that stuff, yeah. uh-huh. you know, I realize no matter what, I was going to be a good man. Uh-huh. You know, whoever I was with I was going to be a good man. Mm-hmm. I would never allow that to happen. And um, it made me question whether or not I was a good man because mm-hmm. I wasn't like I was in my relationship. I was to fix. I made all the compromises. I if, mm-hmm. if she wasn't happy, I did what I could to make her happy. Yeah. And it's like, OK. Why am I not ready to get married? Why am I not ready to give mm-hmm. her this thing? Like if, is, I, if I'm making all these consolations and yeah. stuff like that, it it seems like 
that would be the next logical step. Yeah. And then it's like, what is so broken in me mm-hmm. that I'm not ready to fix this? I can fix this. I mm-hmm. can fix this. Mm-hmm. I can make this right. Why can't I? And it, the only thing I can think of is that it was probably your in just whatever intuition you still had left that hadn't been manipulated yeah. in some way that was, you know, speaking, speaking to you possibly. And that's and, the only thing I can think and of. And my thing too, you know, growing up job witness, mm-hmm. you know, like marriage, that's life. That's for life. That's, that's how I always saw it. it and being complete, I don't want this episode to turn into it <laughs> one on religion or anything like that, but is being completely ignorant of that is 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 that a thing because i know like in it's not like incredibly prevalent but it is prevalent enough in you know when being a jew and stuff like that there is a certain not by my family, but in the families of some of the Jewish women that I've, you know, been partnered with, um, to, to be with someone of the, of the same, to be with another Jew. Oh yeah. No, no, no. Most definitely. And And along with that, it's tough because like, it's because you, you do end up, dealing with a lot of other things that you don't want to or may not be healthy, but just the fact that they are of your religion or of your creed. Yeah, no, that, that was, um, that was a big thing. They were always about that married within the same religion. Uh Well, you know, you're a Jehovah witness. You have to marry another Jehovah witness. Mm -hmm. If you married outside of religion, it was looked down upon. They couldn't stop it. You know, but mm-hmm. it was, you were, but if you wanted to stay in the church, you may get ostracized. Yes. Okay. Like they won't do it. Like there's nothing said that is going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, Oh, you did this. This proclamation says that now you're ostracized. It's just, mm-hmm. it's a known thing. So since we're on the topic and I didn't, I didn't plan on this. <laughs> I mean, do we plan on anything? Very rarely dude. I actually do anything. I plan on it. <laughs> But, um, so we had, we had talked about your religion a little bit. Okay. Yep. When I was, uh, I was having a conversation with, and I'm going to give a shout out, Poyer, if you're out there, you're a good one to talk to. <laughs> the, uh, Ryan always, Ryan's got a lot of knowledge about a, a, a lot of shit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, He's a, he is someone I really enjoy getting into some of these like deeper conversations with. And as I say that, I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Why did I do all those drugs back in never mind. Thank you. Every decade. Um Ah, I remember. Ryan uh and he I'm sure he's not the first per- first person to quote this term, but he brought up, he said, uh, he mentioned religious trauma. Oh yeah. And so oh. generational <laughs> trauma. That's so how many of generations That's of your family were Jehovah's Witness? Just one. Just what? Just my mother. Just your mother? Just my mother. Well, if you don't uh, mind getting in, how did she uh, choose so, that? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, let's okay. check that, okay, and yeah. then I'll get uh, into it. Quick, quick break. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what I'm referring to. Um, but um, so, so we uh, we were just talking about the kind of the religious aspect, yeah. and because that's got to play into. All right, so let me tell you. Let me let I me break looking, some things down. I for guess you. it would make more sense if there were more generations right. of your family. But no, that. not really. So let me break it down for you. Okay. So my mom uh, had me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the situation with my father mm-hmm. was bad. Just he, get a little. Clip. 
the situation with my father, it was bad. Mm-hmm. So, um, large family, not, um, you know, what was it extended family, large extended okay. family. Okay. So she got into it, uh, being introduced by a cousin of hers Mm -hmm. and he got her into it. So she started going, she enjoyed it. She enjoyed being around the people. She had me, Mm -hmm. you know, and so that's how she got into it. So with the rest of my family, not, um, um, not being a part of it. What was the rest of your family? Just were they non, uh, Baptist, 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 holiness, Catholic, so with the can I ask a follow up question? Yeah, go ahead. On that, was um, was your mom shunned at all yes. because of her choice? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, and I, I was about to get into that. Okay. So you I have been smart. Just <laughs> one of well, the things I'm trying to work on is like Heath just shut up the answers. Well, well no. So oh. you have a uh, well, one of my most favorite things was oh well, not really favorite. I can laugh about it now. But my mom would skip holiday dinners mm-hmm. because she was Jehovah's Witness. They don't celebrate holidays, right? Mm-hmm. So she would skip holiday dinners. Like, so say if she skipped Thanksgiving, they would be like, oh, just come to Christmas. You know, it's just dinner with family. Right. And then we would show up to Christmas dinner mm-hmm. and they would start talking smack at the fact that she was there at Christmas dinner. She must be celebrating Christmas. Oh, Stuff like that. So it's like a... Uh. Yeah, like subtle, like fun, subtle jabs, but really meant when it comes from family, you yeah. know it's, exactly yeah, what's going on. There's now. nothing. It's like one of the things I always remember from from acting. The directors and coaches, I would say, were like a character never says anything or does an action without an intention. Yeah, and so that's with and and that's how we are in like real life. Like we don't. We can always come off every every joke someone tells at your expense, whether it's light or not. Like when someone says has no a tinge of honesty. When someone says no offense or I'm just joking, it's like no. Yeah. We no, no we know the truth. Like, yeah, okay. yeah, we know the truth. Don't right. don't come at me Go like that. Fuck yourself. But yeah. uh so she was getting that from family, mm-hmm. but then we're part of this religious organization that highly values the nuclear family right Mm -hmm. so she's a single mom me you Mm -hmm. know she's taking care of me and she's kind of being looked down upon because she's a single mom even within with within the church yes right okay and um so because she's a single mom she's doing what she has to do to take care of me Mm -hmm. and you know i just got i got labels Mm mm-hmm like so so many labels troublemaker you know just like i was a bad kid not saying everyone's like that mm-hmm. cuz there were a few that took me under their wings they watched after me they mm-hmm. you know they they took care of me and that's and what, those and i loved them for that and that's i am i'm sorry i'm glad i'm glad we're getting into this because i one i'd never known the depth you know, that part of your life. And that's one of the things I love about doing this is it's also like an opportunity for us to all get to know each other better because we're fucking best friends and that's priceless in and of itself. But we, we've never really deeply gotten to this side of your life. And even though I, this episode isn't about that, Fuck that! I want to. I, I want to stay on this because I, I want to learn more about it's, you. I mean, it's not so, something that. Again, all right. So being the being the child mm-hmm. of a single mother in that you mentioned there was this, there were some assumptions and stigmas placed on you. Yes, that I was a wayward kid. Because I didn't have so didn't, a mother and father, even though, or, okay, so you know how the relationship you have with your mother is mm-hmm. the relationship you have with your mother. Right. Right? It's not, 
It's the very, relation- very personal. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. So it's not the relationship that other people have with their mothers. It's mm-hmm. between you and her. So my relationship with my mom, because, again, I'm an only child, mm-hmm. she's doing the best she can. Mm-hmm. And a lot of aspects, it was very casual because I had to grow up fast. Mm-hmm. You know, I was I learned how to cook from the time I could look over the stove mm-hmm. like I was growing up fast. So our relationship was casual mm-hmm. and there were people who thought I was so rude because of the way I talked to my mom, but it was, it's me. But that was your interpersonal. Exactly. And that was, you know, that was us. Mm-hmm. It was like, my child would never talk to me like that. I'm not your child. Right. You know, mm-hmm. it was like, she gave birth to me. If she's okay with me talking to her like this, it's none of your business, but you can't say that as a kid. And that's a fucking, like, that's such a great thing. Like, I was, uh, <laughs> like, one of my friends on Instagram was uh, posted something about, just getting all sorts of shit about still, I, I don't remember exactly how old her child is, but getting shit about breastfeeding him still. And it's like, that's nobody else's fucking business. It's not. And that's the like, thing. It, it's fucking, it's just like, and I, I used to hate this fucking phrase, but stay in your fucking lane, people. I like love that it, phrase. If it doesn't, like, someone, how Chris talks to his mom, or how this woman breastfeeds her child, it doesn't affect your life. But that's it. It it doesn't. And as much as you think it might, and as much as you think about, like, all the things, well, it could, like, start this you know, snowball effect. And then like all this other shit blows up. First of all, no, it can't Two, even if it did, who gives a fuck? Well, that's the thing though, especially when it's a religion, Mm -hmm. because everyone believe all children should be like this. Mm -hmm. All children should fall in this mold. Mm -hmm. I'm not falling into that mold because my, my upbringing is different from this child who has both parents mm-hmm. and they're both deeply in this religion. And yeah, your you know. upbringing, your culture, yeah, your everything, everything, especially like everything that made you and your mom probably since we're talking about generational trauma, everything that had made your mother who she was up until the point where she got involved in the church, like. That has nothing to do with it. Nothing. Nothing like, at it, all. It had, it probably, it, I'm sure it had something to do with her joining the church because she was looking for something. Yeah. I, I'm, I can't mo- assume most people, that. I most people get safe in, assumption. Most people get into religion of any type. They're looking for something, right. correct? They're, yeah. They're looking for some sort of answers or a place or, and, you know what? One I, of the conversations we had downstairs when you first got here, an identity, an yeah. identity. And let me, let me say this. My mom mm-hmm. is like, we, again, uh, generational trauma. Mm-hmm. My mom is a survivor, like straight up. Mm-hmm. Like I talk about the fact that she went in love and all of that stuff. And a lot of that was because of how she was raised. Mm-hmm. My mom is a survivor. Mm-hmm. And I believe she deserves all that she wanted. And it hurts that she wasn't able to get that, you know, mm-hmm. I, but exactly. I definitely know. Yeah. So I just, I wanted to put that out there. Um, it's, you know, again, it's generational, mm-hmm. you know, the things she had to deal with that she passed along to me, the mm-hmm. things that I have to deal with that, you know, I mean, my hope is to never pass along to anyone else, mm-hmm. you know, but again, this is, this right here is the perfect outlet for me not to do that, mm-hmm. to be able to express myself and talk about it. And that's one of the things I love about doing this. Um, we should, we're going to make this a two parter. So we'll call this an episode. Sounds good. And um, guys, we'll pick up. Hope you guys enjoyed this. If you're on the live, um, hope you guys have gleaned uh, something from this in is what I would ask you is to kind of look at some of the things you've been through, some of the things you were raised with and ask yourself, 
Okay, how is that? Let me stop this. I don't want to 